Brian stole my opening because I I'd finished the Chernow book on Grant uh, a couple months ago, and I was going to talk about Reconstruction. But um, this is always this is a real honor to be here with you. I look at every single table and pe see people that I've known for a long time and respect enormously. And uh, John Dalton is here from my hometown, and. Uh, Mac McClarty is from uh, next to my parents' hometown in South Arkansas, and um, and Brian and I went to went to college. I, I I may have been ahead of you, but I, I'm sure you were above me. Uh, <laughs> Uh, I tell people I was admitted under an affirmative action program for Protestants from Southern public schools. But <laughs> anyway, um, what I'm going to do, I know all of you, uh, part of what your, your day jobs is to try to make sense of American politics to people. And I would just ask that um, if you figure it out, please contact me as soon as you can. Um, but, but actually, the way I, I, I try to you know, look for what is the best way to communicate to normal people what seems to be happening. And there not being any normal people in this room, um, but, but I know you are going to be talking to normal people. So um, the way I sort of characterize this election is that it's like we have a, what appears to be a Democratic tidal wave up against a Republican seawall. And the question is, which is going to be tall? You know, which is going to be stronger, the wave or or the wall? And the 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 House situation is different from the Senate, which is different from the states and all of that. But I think a lot of people don't appreciate. You know, everybody in this room has heard many many times people say, "Well, you know, the upcoming election is the most important since Moby Dick was a guppy." You know, and, and the thing is, you know, generally speaking, it's hyperbole. This one, could, this one is, is like a really, really, really big one. And now everybody in this room knows that all 435 House races are up every two years, but how often do you see the House just teetering right on the edge? Just right on the edge. Very, very, very rarely. And every two years we have a third of the Senate up. But how often do you have the House teetering on the edge and the Senate 51-49. Wow, that's really something. And then when you consider the increasing inability, unwillingness of Washington to deal with the problems and you think about all the power going out to the states and how important governorships and state legislative uh, races are, what a lot of people don't realize is that three quarters of the nation's governors are up in this midterm election cycle or up this year, three quarters, and four fifths of the state legislative seats are up in this cycle, not the presidential cycle, not in the odd numbered years, but this one. And this is a really, really, really big deal. And when you consider the massive losses that Democrats had in the midterm elections in 2010 and 14, losing a majority of the governorships, losing their majority of state legislative chambers around the country, losing actually over a thousand state legislative seats net during the eight years of, of President Obama's uh, tenure. Uh, Republicans have all, you know, I, I guess you can pay one of two ways. You could either say A, Republicans now, from top to bottom, hold more offices than they've held at any time since the 1920s. So if you're a Republican, you can be very proud of that. If you're a Democrat, you know, they only got one way to go, and that's down. And Republic, given how many open seats that Republicans have, what, about 50 open House seats, the most number of open House, Republican House seats in in the post-World War II era, but think of all those Republican governors and state legislators in states with term limits that got elected in 2010. Most of them, 2014 was a great year for Republicans as well. So they're term limited in 2016 and open seats. And so there is a whole, whole, whole lot riding on this election. now. Everybody, uh, let's talk, what I'm going to do is talk about the wave for a few minutes and then talk about the wall and then sort of handicap it a little bit. Um, everybody here knows uh, 
that midterm elections are referenda on the incumbent president. Now, we all know that, but I think, you know, the numbers are, are really pretty compelling. Um, 35 out of 38 midterm elections since the end of the Civil War, whichever party had the White House had a net loss of House seats, 35 out of 38, 92%. Mac, that would be the War of Northern Aggression. Um, <laughs> just, just, uh, and, um, the Senate, I shouldn't have done that, That's, but he's a lovely man. Um, <laughs> and in the Senate, since we started the direct election of senators in 1913, after the 17th Amendment passed, we've had 26 midterms. Party in the White House has lost net loss of Senate seats in 19 out of 26, 73 percent. But we don't think of it much in terms of governorships, but guess what? It's there too. If you start looking at all the governorships since uh, beginning of the last century, 1902 forward, party in the White House has had a net loss of governorships in 26 out of the 29 uh, midterm elections, 90%. And even down in the state legislative races, uh, 20, uh, 27 out of 29, 93%. Now, why does this happen? And political scientists have all kinds of theories and there's merit to a bunch of them. But the way I look at it, to borrow a phrase that my mother used to use, but not in a political context, but to me, the people that disproportionately vote in midterm elections are people who have their noses out of joint. Is that a South Arkansas expression? Okay, back now. It, it, you know, think of it this way, any given midterm year, if you liked what happened in the last election, if you're satisfied with what's going on, hopefully you vote. We want everybody to vote. But maybe you do, maybe you don't. But it's the people that are angry, the people that are fearful, the people that are anxious, they have that extra motivation and disproportionately they vote. And I think that is a real, real, real factor here and where it's who's voting and that's what translates into the up to down, and keep in mind that we're, you know, every one of us here heard when we were growing up, people say, well, I vote the person, not the, not the party. Well, the thing about it is, that's basically not true anymore. I mean, it, it was a little bit of an exaggeration before, but now, and in fact, actually, the Pew Research Center just released a study where they looked and you know uh, they they looked at U.S. Senate races, and 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 um, they found and how the how that state went presidentially and how that state went on the U.S. Senate. And what's interesting, we noticed this on election night last year or two years ago. This was the first time in American history that every single U.S. Senate race went the same direction, party-wise, that the presidential race in that state went. That's never happened before. And Pew has a great graph where they look at the uh, same state, different, um, and that it's really, really compelling. Now, the other th another thing that everybody here has heard um, is the old Tip O'Neill adage about all politics is local. And to me, what O'Neill meant when he said that back in the 70s and 80s was, if you wanna know what's happening in a state or district, you look at the people that live there, the population, the demographics, the voting patterns, the local issues and campaigns and circumstances, that sort of thing, and usually you can figure out what's likely to happen. But even back when, when O'Neill said that, it was a little bit of an exaggeration because about once every 10 years, you would have an election where all politics wasn't local, where you would have this invisible hand that would be sort of pushing, to borrow a term from economics, uh, pushing the candidates of one party forward or up and pulling down or back the candidates of the other party. Now, I was born in 1953. I don't remember it, but 1958, Eisenhower's in the White House, Democratic wave. 1966, Lyndon Johnson's in the White House, Republican wave. 1974, Gerald Ford's in the White House, Democratic wave. 1982, Reagan's in the White House, Democratic wave. Um, at least in the House, and I'll talk about the Senate more in a couple minutes. But it would be about once every decade. But that changed in 1994. And now people vote in a much more, almost a parliamentary way. And we all remember 1994, uh, 
uh, President Clinton's first term, midterm election, when Democrats lost eight Senate seats and control the Senate, and 54 House seats and control the House as well. Then look at 2006, the, uh, the um, uh, George W. Bush's mid, uh, second term midterm election. Republicans lost six seats and control of the Senate, uh, 30 House seats and control of the House. 2010, President Obama's first midterm election, Democrats lost 63 seats uh, and control of the House. And in his second midterm election, they lost nine Senate seats and control of the Senate. Now, what I'm trying to get at is keeping in mind that the House had been in Democratic hands for 40 years, for 20 consecutive elections up until 94. The Senate had been in Democratic hands for 34 out of 40 years. Now, we've last six midterm elections in four out of six, either the House or the Senate or both have flipped. Things have changed. These wave things, are, elections are becoming much more frequent, much more explosive than they used to be. So, can, let me, so one, when we start talking about the wave, you first have midterm election patterns, and then you look at polls, and then you look at election results since November of 2016. We know that um, of the last eight midterm elections, in four of them, the president, whoever the president was, had their, their last Gallup job approval rating going into election day was over 50%. Now, actually, in four, uh, four out of eight, and actually, each of the four, it was 56% or higher. And if you look at the outcome, Senate, House, minimal net change, usually more often losses than not, but, but minimal, minimal, minimal. But in the other four, the president had a job approval rating of 46% or less, and the average was a seven-seat loss in the Senate and 40 seats in the House of Representatives. Wow, that's, that's a whole lot. Sadly, we don't have any examples of 47 to 55, so, you know, where the splits really occur, we're not so sure. So um, let's get to, get to President Trump. Um, the unique thing about the Trump, well, I was going to say the unique thing about the Trump presidency. Um, <laughs> one of the many things that are unique about the Trump presidency is the lack of a honeymoon. I mean, just, you know, normally there's a reservoir of goodwill for a new president. And, and, and keep in mind, for example, uh, George W. Bush. Uh, you don't become president under circumstances a whole lot worse than the other side won the popular vote, you won the Electoral College based on a contested state and a case that went all the way to the U.S. Supreme Court. That's not an optimal circumstance. But at the end of his first week in office, President Bush's first, George W. Bush, first Gallup job approval rating was 56, it was either 56 or 58, I think it was 56 percent. So clearly there were some people that didn't vote for him, but were willing to give him the initial benefit of the doubt. President Obama, one week in, he was at 63 percent. I think President Clinton was at 50, mid-50s. I mean, where you, 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 you get this benefit of the doubt. Well, President Trump never got that, that uh, he would receive 46% of the popular vote, and his first Gallup job approval rating was 45%. And then if you kind of go through the year, um, his numbers were always horrible with Democrats. They generally didn't move much among independents. But over, overall, his approval rating, that, these are just using Gallup numbers just because they're standard methodology. I mean, you're looking at Granny Smith apples compared to Granny Smith apples. I mean, precise comparisons. So in the first quarter of last year, the president's approval rating was 41%. Second quarter, 39%. The third and fourth quarters, 37%. And then in the first quarter of this year, it was 39%, so it curled up uh, uh, about two points. Now, what was driving it is over the course of last year, the, as I said, the presence numbers among Democrats and independents really didn't move much. 
but among Republicans, it was sort of gradually declining over the course of the year. And it makes some sense if you think about it. You know, they had really high expectations of what would happen. And we're going to repeal and replace Obamacare. We're going to build a border wall, big infrastructure, cut taxes. And for 11 months, the first 11 months of the year, they were 0 for 4. So a certain disillusionment set in. So by the time we got to the last quarter in the Gallup polling, uh, the president's approval rating every week during that quarter was between 77 and 83% among Republicans, okay? Then the tax cut pass, passes in December. And the interesting thing is it didn't instantaneously jump up Republican numbers. There was a lag of a few weeks and I frankly think it was when a lot of big companies started handing out raises and bonuses and sweeten, announcing they were sweetening up uh, retirement packages, that sort of thing. And you saw the president's job approval rating jump up among Republicans to the point where most weeks now he's between 85 and 90 as opposed to 77 to 83. So it really kind of puts some starch in the shorts of Republicans and kind of the, you know, because tax, you know, tax cuts, it's like the, the one issue that unifies Republicans more than anything else. Um, um, so that it, it, it made a huge, huge, huge difference. But then it sort of kind of started coming down a little bit and then you started getting some pretty good economic news and some interesting developments in North Korea that you think, well, maybe this is kind of diffusing a, a bet, you know, who knows what the heck is going to end up happening. But, you know, it looks like, you know, we're not going to get blown up this week. So, you know, it, it, there was, it, and, and you, you saw the president's numbers curl up a little bit. And interestingly, it went up a little among independents, but it actually went up a little bit among Democrats. And he had gone, and we're talking really small numbers here, but the president had gone 51 weeks without seeing a double-digit approval rating among Democrats. Generally, it was five to eight, five to nine. And then we went through a period of like, I think it's five of the last nine weeks that it went up to, it was in double digits. No, not big double digits, but 10 to 12, 13, something like that. And it was economy and Korea that were, that were, that were driving it. And then you had last week. Um, and, um, you know, just using, again, using the, the, the Gallup numbers, um, um, that the president's approval rating uh, this past week, in other words, through Sunday night, was 41%, down four points from 45% the previous week, so 41. Disapproval of 55, up five points uh, from 50. And his approval rate among Republicans uh, was at 87%, down, from, down three points from 90. Among independents, it was 38%, down four points from 42. And among Democrats, it was 5%, where from 10 to 5 in a week. And that's kind of a lot of shifting going on going on there uh, where clearly the immigration you know all those stories uh, you know it was it was it was really 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 biting so but the point is the presidents now uh, we, we we've seen in the uh, one of the things I always look at is real clear politics and Nate Silver's 538 and on approval rating, real clear, he's at 43. Uh, Nate Silver's 538, he's at 42.3. So in that his numbers are better than they were last fall, but they're still in that zone. Most of you are old enough, well, everybody here looks old enough to remember Lost in Space. And remember that robot when something bad was happening? You know, danger, Will Robinson, danger, danger. Well, you know, these are poll numbers that are flashing, that are, are, are flashing danger. And, um, um, and it's pretty much, uh, you know, ABC, Washington Post, 44, CBS, 42, CNN, 39, Fox, 45, NBC, Wall Street Journal, 44. You get the general idea. They're all sort of in that point, but they're all in, in, that, in the danger zone. But 
to be fair, they're better than where they were last fall. Now, one of the things we're looking at, and, 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 and actually I should say that at every point in the last, uh, since taking office, uh, er, until about a little over a month ago, um, at every single point, every single week along the way, the president's numbers were below that of any other elected president in post-World War II history. Now, there was a week or two that his went up a bit and Jimmy Carter's had done gone down, so he passed up Carter for a week or two, but now Carter's back above, above where President Trump is. But every single one but, to be fair, we're now in the zone where President Obama at this point was at 46%. Yeah, President Obama at this point in June of 2010 was at 46. President Clinton was at 46. Now, you remember what happened there. Uh, Ronald Reagan was at 45, where they didn't get scalped, but it was a close call, and President Carter was at 43 at this point. So. Uh, this is this is clearly in the in the sort of danger area. Now, one of the things that I think is most nerve-wracking for Republicans is the is is looking at the intensity, because, in my opinion, intensity is what in effect elected President Trump. That, you know, going back to 2016, and I won't make this long because I know it's replowing old ground, but that to me. Once you got past the final debate, once you got past the Billy Bush tape, man, you know, it was like put a fork in it. This thing's done. I mean, it just didn't, it seemed to be over. And at that point, I think two things, you know, on the Democratic side, what you had was all of the ambivalence that so many Democrats had just started coming up to the top. And one group would rather have had Bernie Sanders, and another group would rather have had Joe Biden, and another group would rather have had anybody else. And you know, and, Pre and, and Secretary Clinton is obviously a incredibly bright and talented person, but she had accumulated a whole lot of baggage over those years, uh, without necessarily the charm that her husband had. And there was just a lot of ambivalence there. Um, and she didn't get the pop for being the first woman nominee that one might have expected. I mean, I, would, I, think, I, I think if almost any other woman was the first woman nominee for a party, you would have seen something more like what happened, what President Obama enjoyed or Senator Obama enjoyed in 2008. But that just didn't happen. And whether, well, the election's over, Trump can't possibly win. And, um, you know, I didn't particularly like her anyway, so I'm going to vote for Jill Stein. Um, by the way, am I the only person in America that didn't know that that famous picture in Moscow of the banquet with, with Putin and General Flynn, that Jill Stein is in the photograph? <laughs> now, I'm sure it's because of Vladimir Putin's commitment to global climate change and, and to addressing environmental issues. I'm sure that's it. But, wow, anyway. Uh, or you want to legalize weed and throw a vote for Gary Johnson or just pick up a gallon of milk on the way home for, instead of stopping to vote, or whatever. But on the other side, you had an intensity. You had one group of people that just really liked Donald Trump. You had another group of people that just liked the idea of any business person getting elected. You had a third group of people, more conventional Republicans, that didn't really wild about Trump, but I'm a Republican and I'm the Supreme Court and judicial nominations is important, so I'm gonna stand in. You know, and the fourth were people that just hated Hillary Clinton. She called me deplorable. So you had an intensity over here and that you know, virtually everyone who voted or intended to vote for Hillary Clinton assumed she was going to win. And my guess is most of the people that voted for Donald Trump assumed he was going to lose, but by God, they were going to vote no matter what. 
And so this intensity ambivalence thing, I think, is, is, is very, very real. Well, right now we're seeing an intensity gap between the two sides, but it's the shoes on the other foot. And when you look at the polls that do approve, disapprove, but then follow up and say, well, do you say you strongly approve or only somewhat, or do you strongly disapprove or somewhat? And consistently, um, th these are all polls taken in June um, in, in the CNN. 28% strongly approve the job President Trump is doing, 28%, 45 strong disapprove. In the NBC Wall Street Journal poll, 26 strong approve, 42 strong disapprove. Fox News poll, 27 strong approve, 41 strong disapprove. You get the general idea that there is about a one and a half to one intensity ratio of strong disapprove to strong approve. In the NBC Wall Street Journal poll, which is my favorite because they've done for years teamed up Democratic and Republican pollsters and for decades you've had public opinion strategies, the biggest and just a fabulous uh, Republican polling firm, and then Hart Research on the Democratic side. Uh, but one of the things they asked in their June survey was on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate your interest in the upcoming election with nine or 10, meaning most interested? 63% of Democrats put themselves, said, said they were nines or tens, 63%. Just 47% of Republicans were, said they were nines and tens. Um, and, you know, you just sort of look at that and go, you know, and I think that, uh, I'm, I don't want to pretend that I'm an intellectual or anything, but, but um, uh, you know, Nietzsche said, what doesn't kill you makes you stronger. Well, with, for President Trump, what hurts him so badly outside of the Republican base only intensifies the people that are for him. And it says something about redistricting. It says something about the media environment we have where we've created these ideological silos that are just building up a level of ideological intensity that we've never, never seen before. Then there's the generic. And I've, I've never seen an election where more people paying attention to the generic. But a lot of times people aren't watching it. They're, they're watching it, but they're not watching it regularly enough where they have sort of artifacts in their memories of what, what happened. Last fall, Democrats were ahead by double digits, 10, 12, 13. We generally think that Democrats probably need to win the national popular vote by about seven percentage points in order to win 218 seats in the House. And I'll talk about that more in a minute. So last fall, it was double digits. Uh, then it narrowed down to three or four points. Uh, right now in the real clear politics average, it's uh, six point, Democrats are up 6.3 percentage points. In 538, it was 7.4. NBC, Democrats up by 10. Fox News, Democrats up by nine. CNN, Democrats up by eight. The closest one is Pew Research, Democrats up by five. But Again, this is sort of, it doesn't mean, it's not lead pipe cinch, God no, it's not. But it's flashing danger, danger, danger. And, and keeping in mind the president's right now at 41, he's averaged 39% Gallup for his entire presidency. The last Gallup approval ratings before the midterm elections, uh, President uh, Reagan had a 43% and Republicans lost 26 seats in the House. Um, President Clinton had 45% in the last Gallup poll before the 2010 midterm, uh, before the 1994 midterm. Obama was at 45. Uh, Carter was at 49. That actually wasn't that disastrous, but that was before we had sort of the hyper partisanship we have now. So basically, the polling is flashing danger, danger, danger. So then we look at election results. What have, when people have actually voted since November of 2016, uh, what have they done? Now, if I work for the Democratic National Committee, I would stand up here and proudly say, I'll stay over here, and proudly say there were five midterm elections last year and Republicans went 0 for 5 and that that means that President Trump is radioactive and the Republican Party is in a free fall, yada, yada, yada. Now, I think Republicans have all kinds of problems and I think President Trump is a really big liability. However, does anybody here really think that the Alabama Senate race in December was about President Trump or the National Party? 
And, and with all due respect to Doug Jones, the Democrat who won, who was a really good candidate, ran a great campaign, and had lots of money and all that, but Roy Moore was radioactive even before we knew he had an unusual interest in high school girls. <laughs> And I mean, think, think of it this way. In American history, we've probably had, I'm guessing, about 10,000 state Supreme Court justices. And you ask yourself, of those 10,000, how many have been removed from the bench? Not counting the states that elect them, that they just lost re-election. How, how many got removed twice? <laughs> how many chief justices have been removed twice? I suspect we're looking at a sample of one in American history, and that's before the high school girls came along. And if I sound a little bitter, um, maybe it's when I realized that in his 30s, Roy Moore dated more high school girls than I did when I was in high school. And so I, I anyway, and then, and then New Jersey, you know, hey, Chris Christie, you know, after the Bridgegate thing, you know, I think there are probably social diseases in New Jersey that had higher favorable ratings than Chris Christie had. So his poor lieutenant governor, give me a break, she never had a chance. So I sort of take those two out of the sample, because I, but that does leave the three races in Virginia, the governor's race, lieutenant governor, attorney general. And it's not a shocker that Democrats won or held the governorship. But the fact that Ralph Northam, who I've never met him, but he appears to be the most boring politician on the face of the earth, he won by nine percentage points. And half the people in this room probably know Ed Gillespie. Smart guy, worked hard, didn't say anything stupid, didn't do anything stupid, actually outperformed what winning Republican candidates in Virginia do in southern, southwestern Virginia, small town, rural, but just got slaughtered in the suburbs. And specifically, college-educated white suburban voters and college-educated white suburban women you know, he's lucky if his wife voted for him. I mean, <laughs> this is, and he didn't do anything wrong. I mean, no, that, that he, that Northam won by nine points. Now, you might be thinking, nobody knows who's the lieutenant governor or the attorney general. That can't m mean anything. Well, that's actually the point, because nobody knows who the attorney general, uh, general and lieutenant governor are. That actually makes it a decent barometer to look at. And the fact that Democrats won those by four, five, six points. Uh, wow, that's, you know, that, that, was, that was meaningful. Then we had congressional special elections, and we had five of them last year where Republicans could conceivably have lost. And they didn't lose any of the five last year. But on average, the Democrat outperformed Secretary Clinton by 12 percentage points in their respective districts. 12 points? That's a lot. And then we had Connor Lamb in the Pennsylvania 18. And since the election, we've had 44 previously Republican state legislative seats go Democrat. Four Democrat, only four Democratic seats have gone Republican. Now, again, you could explain away individually, but this is a pattern that's really, really pretty unmistakable that Republicans have a big, big, big problem. So. That's the wave. Now let's talk about the wall. If, if someone had asked me five years ago, what's well, a if, when people asked me five years ago, what are the chances of Republicans losing their majority in the House of Representatives this decade? And I unwisely probably would have said not much, not much of a chance. And, 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 and because we, where district lines are and you know when a party, you know, you never want to have an ugly election, but given how many governorships and state legislative, and that's, you know, who draws the maps in 47 out of 50 states, the state legislatures, sometimes the governors are involved, sometimes not, but given they're all up in, you know, so many are up in midterm election years, you never want to lose an election, but, but losing the last midterm before redistricting, man, that's like the defeat that keeps on defeating. Well, 2010, and Democrats just got killed in that election, 
And so Republicans were finally able to do through the redistricting process to Democrats what Democrats had done to Republicans for so many years. Now, not every state. I live in Maryland, and we have a Democratic gerrymander there, and people who live in Illinois, they certainly have one there. But in most states, these are very friendly maps for Republicans that constitute something of a wall. Then there's one thing that's a little less insidious, and that's just population patterns. And if you think about it, keep it in mind that once you win a district by one vote, everything you get above that there in that district is wasted. Where do Democratic voters live? Urban areas, cities and college towns. And where do Republican voters live? Well, everywhere else. That Republican voters are just more efficiently allocated around the country and Democratic voters are highly concentrated in the cities. Democrats just waste a lot of votes. So between these two things, it is a very, very substantial wall protecting the Republican majority in the House. Now, five years ago, when someone would have asked me what are the chances of Democrats picking a majority up in the, in, the, in, the, in the House this decade, and I unwisely would have said not much, if I were a smarter person, what I would have said, not much of a chance, comma, unless you had a Republican president with really sucky numbers. And, 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 you know, that's the ironic thing is when you see all these members of Congress, House and Senate, and they all want their side to win the White House, they really actually shouldn't because bad things usually don't happen to your side if the other team has the White House, okay? You get bit, you know, anyway. So, um, anyway, so right now the wall is pretty substantial, but we would give probably two chances out of three that the wave is going to be taller than the wall. I mean, right now, we think the wave is more likely to, the Democrats are more likely to get a majority in the House. They need 23 seats. Right now, this is looking most likely to be in the 20 to 40 range. Now, obviously, if it's 20, 21, or 22, then Republicans hold on to by their fingernails. But if it's 24 or more, then Democrats get the majority. Now, here's the catch. Democrats, given 23 seats is the magic number, Democrats would need to win more than 46 seats to get a majority that is as big as, or as narrow as the Republican is now. So in other words, under 46, 46 or under, they've got a tiny, tiny majority just like Republicans have now and not much of, I mean, you can't get a lot done with the majority that narrow, and then particularly when the other side has the White House. So this thing would have to break really big for Democrats to have some really you know, meaningful numbers uh, in, in the House, and I'm a little skeptical of that because I just think that wall and the patterns make it real difficult to go north of 40, north of 40 seats, but hey, it, it, it could get there. And one thing is that when you see these waves happen, um, they always go bigger than you think. That back in, I mean, I vividly remember 1994. I still have the tread marks uh, from, uh, on my back from that election. And Republicans needed a 40-seat net gain. And we could count up 30, 31, 32 places where Republicans could pick up Democratic seats. You couldn't get to 40. You just couldn't get there. And yet, on election night, they got 52 and two more with party switches after. I mean, the thing about it is you had people that didn't get a dime from the NRCC who who won, who knocked off Democrats, not a dime. And conversely, 2006, when Democrats took the House back and Rahm Emanuel was a chair and did a terrific job and the whole team there was really good, there were Democrats that beat Republicans in 2006 that didn't get a dime out of the DCCC. That when these things start, there's a cascading effect on some of these wave elections. So you have to be very, very, very careful. But we'd put it about 65%. Now, the Senate, spoiler alert, the wall is a heck of a lot higher in the Senate and uh, higher than in the House, and the wall looks taller than the wave. And you guys, I need to speed up so we can get to Q&A. Um, you guys know the numbers, 26 Democratic seats up, only nine Republican seats. This is a product of Democrats 
uh, given the last two times that this group of Senate seats were up, this class of Senate seats, Democrats picked up six seats back in 2006, the Bush second term, midterm election, and then Democrats picked up two more when President Obama was getting reelected by three point margin in 2012. So Democrats are way, way, way overexposed. But it's actually worse than that, just worse than the 26 to nine uh, numbers suggest because there are five Democratic seats. There are 10 Democratic seats up in states that President Trump carried. There's only one Republican seat up in a state that Senator, that Secretary Clinton carried, that's Dean Heller in Nevada. But it's actually kind of worse than this because to me, the, there are five Democratic Senate seats up in states that, that Mitt Romney won by nine points or more and Donald Trump won by 19 points or more. So if you're a Heidi Heidekamp in North Dakota, a state that Romney won by 20, Trump by 36, Joe Manchin in West Virginia, Romney by 27, Trump by 42, Joe Donnelly in Indiana, Romney by 10, Trump by 19, Clara McCaskill in Missouri, Romney by nine, Trump by 19, John Tester in Montana, Romney by 14, Trump by 21, I'm not saying they're all going to lose because I don't think they're all going to lose. I'd be surprised, frankly, if John Tester lost. But the thing is, you've got five Democrats. You start off with five Democrats deep behind enemy lines. I mean, these are in really, really difficult places. And these five don't even include the Democrat who I think is in the most trouble, and that's Bill Nelson in Florida. Now you might say, well, wait a minute, Trump only carried Florida by one point. How could that be more vulnerable than places like Trump winning where Trump won by 42 points? Well, to me, you look at a challenger, a Senate challenger, and you say, who meets these four tests? Statewide name recognition at the beginning of the race. Two, a statewide organization at the beginning of the race. Three, a clear ability to raise enough money to do whatever you need to do, and four, has won tough competitive general election, statewide general elections. Well, you've just defined Rick Scott. And in fact, of all the Republican challengers, that's the one there that, 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 that is like flashing danger, danger, danger. So um, Democrats have four, five, six Senate seats that they need to really, really, really worry about. And conversely, over on the other side, um, Republicans obviously have to worry about Dean Heller in, in Nevada, uh, clearly. But I think people would be really surprised to hear what the chances that Democrats have of picking up the Arizona and Tennessee open seats. In fact, actually, CBS released a poll over the weekend that had Democrats up a little bit in both Arizona and Tennessee. But uh, now, in Tennessee, this is about, well, anyway, I under you know, it save time. But Republicans have three seats they have to really worry about. Democrats have four, five, six that they have to really worry about. We put it two, in, two out of three chances that Republicans hold on to their majority in the Senate. Now, a couple of things make me nervous. Well, first of all, we could see three quarters of a billion dollars spent on the U.S. Senate this year or this cycle with the most likely single outcome, no net change whatsoever, or one side or the other picking up one seat. And if Democrats pick up one seat, it's 50-50, and Vice President Pence still breaks the tie. If Republicans pick up one seat, it goes up to 52. And so the odds of this going outside of plus one, minus one, no change, it's probably three out of, four, three out of four chances that, that, and yet, hey, you're looking at the Senate on the edge. And what really makes me nervous is that when, when Jennifer Duffy, our Senate editor, has looked back at the last 10 cycles, on average, in each individual one of these cycles, these are presidential and midterms, eight, 80% on average have broken the same way within each of those years. In other words, they don't split down the middle. They go overwhelmingly one direction or the other. And to me, it's that last whiff. Oh, didn't mean to go that. Then the dominoes start falling one direction. And that that just happens a lot. The other thing that makes me nervous 
is I remember vividly the last cycle before I started my newsletter. It was back in 1982, and it was that recession under President Reagan. Republicans lost 26 seats in the House. They frankly would have lost more if Democrats had more candidates, but Democrats had just gotten shellacked in 1980, and they had a little bit of difficulty making the transition from defense to offense, you know, because they were kind of bracing themselves to lose more seats. And then we have this recession and all that. But in the Senate, what was interesting is Republicans had no net change on election day, and, but they won four Senate races by a grand total of less than 40,000 votes. In Vermont, Nevada, Rhode Island, Delaware, by 39,923 votes. That saved the Republican majority. And we've got a lot of small states up this time North Dakota, with competitive races, North Dakota, Nevada, West Virginia, so that you could see the Senate right on the edge with relatively few, few, few votes separating between majority and minority status. So that's a really big. Now, finally, and then Brian, once you start wandering up so we could get to the Q&A, uh, in the states where state uh, governorships and legislative seats, uh, there's, you know, the, the, the Democratic wave is the same height everywhere, but although there's some altitude things, some, some states are just, or districts are higher than others, but in the legislature and governorships, there's no wall at all where it's Republicans that are grossly over overexposed because of how well they did the last four years ago and eight years ago. So no wave, no wall. Uh, or, excuse me, big wave, no wall for Republicans in the, in the governorship and state legislature. So now let me come over here. Charlie, I wish you were a little more passionate about your work. <laughs> Um, I hope people have been taking notes because there's going to be a blue book exam uh, before you can leave today. How do you keep those numbers in your head? Actually, the better question is how do you keep all those numbers in your head when you had such a crappy e of math SAT score? Uh, <laughs> it's repetition. What's, what's uh, Bryce Harper's batting average, right? Uh, I, you'd have to ask my wife. Not, the she's smartest a, guys I know learned to, to She's keep, the passionate baseball fan keeps and family. To keep baseball statistics. That's how it works. Let me, I'm gonna, we're going to get to your questions. I hope everybody's got some questions. We have a, a, a nice little chunk of time here. But let me start, Charlie, with um, what are the wild cards? I mean, you sort of postulate two-thirds. Okay, we, we get that interesting right now. That's the snapshot. What are the wild cards that could upend that? Immigration, the state of the economy, foreign affairs. What, what do you look at that could change that? Trajectory. Let's put it in two categories. What, what could narrow this intensity gap between Democrats that are highly motivated and Republicans that are less so? And then on the other side is what, what could hurt Republicans? So in that first category, um, I, I think probably uh, the economy could ease up, I mean, I mean, could move up and could change things a little bit. But to be honest, I think it's... Uh, I think it's more, you give me a Supreme Court vacancy and I'll show you intensity. I mean, the thing is, Democrats are so intense right now, there's not much that would get them more, more intense. But there's nothing like a, a Supreme Court fight, particularly if it were, say, a, mm, Anthony Kennedy, the swing vote on the court. Oh, yeah, that would get people, that would get. The second thing is, um, Every, I, I, I understand why Nancy Pelosi wants to shoot any Democrat who uses the impeachment word on television and probably wants to strangle Tom Steyer. I mean, that it's like, it's as if every time the word impeachment gets mentioned, five to 10,000 Trump voters wake up. And, and I would say Maxine Waters' comments over the weekend, or th that's just pouring gasoline on a fire. I mean, Democrats ought to go out of their way to not say anything incendiary. And, and the thing is that if this thing is a referendum up or down on President Trump, Democrats will win the majority. Right. And it's only if they interfere with it in some way if they don't, it don't. Um, and the odds of that are how close to zero? Um, <laughs> well, do they interfere enough? But the, the flip side, 
I, I uh, everybody here has been in, here at this town a long time, and nobody knows what special counsels do. I mean, you know, but the thing about it is, I think that anyone who has not abandoned President Trump yet, they're not going to. I mean, I think the truest thing the man ever said in his entire life is that he could shoot someone on Fifth Avenue and his supporters would stick with him. I, I absolutely believe that. That, um, and, and the thing is, it's true in terms of the investigation and it's true in policy. Um, I was at an ag event way out of Washington a couple months ago, and I was sitting next to a beef cattleman, and I was asking him, um, do you worry about, do you get worried about this talk of tariffs? And he said, yes, I, I, I worry about the tariffs. And then in less than two or three seconds, he said, but you know what? I think everything the president is doing is what he thinks is in the national interest, and I support him 100%. Well, there. And so what we're talking about is uh, social, cultural. I mean, when you're looking at, when you look at small town, rural America, whites in small town, rural, whites working class, whites with four year college degree or less. And, and this doesn't, I mean, all, all, obviously all Trump supporters do not fit in this category, but these are not people that are voting their economic self-interest. These are people that are voting culture. He is speaking to me. He is speaking for me. We've been ignored. And then conversely, I mean, Tom Davis, who I think is one of the smartest people in this city, uh, he, he believes, and I'm starting to agree with him, that we are seeing a realignment. We are seeing college-educated, upscale, white suburbanites moving more democratic while working class, rural, small town, whites are moving more Republican. We are seeing more people vote, in my judgment, against their own economic self-interest than ever before. In those upscale whites, maybe it's abortion, maybe it's environment, maybe it's guns, maybe it's President Trump's behavior. You know, Lord knows what it is, but the thing is, there, we're seeing these trending, trend lines in opposite directions, and it's really changing the electorate enormously. Questions here, out here. Well, uh, one over there. Back, yes, man, back there, straight back. Yes. Hi, thank you very much. Very interesting. Marisa Lino with Northrop Grumman. I've voted in every election since I was old enough to vote, and I, even when I was living overseas. I think the thing that bothers me the most, and I'd like to know whether how how all of the figures you've given us correlate with the percentage of people who vote in these elections. And as a corollary, do you ever think an Australian system uh, would work here? They have mandatory uh, voting with a fine if you don't vote. Basically, one third, the people who voted, um, midterm election turnout is about a third lower than in a presidential year. But that third isn't a cross-section of the total. I mean, it, 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 it varies from cycle to cycle and generally skews against whichever the party's in power. So it's, it's a third lower. But when we're looking at, that's where these intensity numbers, the nines and tens come in, for example. Um, those are people that are really, really likely to vote. Uh, the people that strongly approve or strongly disapprove, those are the people that are more likely uh, to vote. So um, the fact that fewer people are voting, that actually makes a big difference in midterm elections, and it worked against Democrats in 2010 and 14, and I think it's going to work against Republicans in this election. Um, so, uh, and. I, you actually threw me a curveball because I thought you were going to ask about the Australian ballot that Maine and, and uh, uh, the preferential ballot. And I've always thought it was really weird and didn't really understand it and thought we're never going to adopt that. But, but I'm now getting to the point where things are so screwed up that I'm still skeptical that we would embrace some completely different concept of voting. 
with people rank ordering their preferences, but I'm the point where I'd try almost anything. <laughs> I mean, I'm sure, why not? I mean, and I'm someone, I don't like change. I think change is vastly overrated. I, I wish, you know, but, but, uh, but by the way, about your company, I bet you didn't know that Northrop Grumman, or Grumman, used to make canoes. You did, because we have one, or actually I've got one back in my hometown that I'm bringing up. It's an aluminum, after World War II, they had all this aluminum around, and they started making some terrific canoes, and my dad got one in the late 1940s, and that thing is still... <laughs> really? <laughs> okay. Wow. Uh, right up front here, yes ma'am. Okay, and then Heather we'll come over, over here. here. Yeah, we've been. I'm, I'm Mary Moore Hamburg yes. with Grant Thornton. Can you talk about what economic and trade factors that you would watch that could change the elect, change the landscape between now and the election? Well, thank you, Mary Moore, and thank you for sponsoring this. Oh, I was, no, no, go ahead, go ahead. I was just oh, trying to get the microphone well, to come over here. Come on over. Here. You know, I think this hard. Let me do immigration and pivot to trade. You know, we had had this immigration fight for a long time, but until it took this twist with kids, it really wasn't getting traction. And, you know, in the big scheme of things, this is actually a relatively small aspect of the over immigration debate, but this is where it started getting home. I think this Harley Davidson thing, I think this is a, I, I think a lot of the people that are supportive of President Trump and supportive of protectionism, um, they were just absolutely not believing, not willing to believe that there could be any real side effects from this. And Harley Davidson, I mean, this, it, 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 you couldn't find a cleaner, clearer example than Harley Davidson. No other, nothing else in America. That's, that's the one. And, and, and so, you know, I'm not, but at the same time, this is trade and a border wall. These more than any, well, okay, throw in repeal and replace. But these were the three core issues that went to the heart of, of Donald Trump's candidacy. Now, I guess, now that I'm thinking about it, when was the last, he doesn't talk so much about repeal and replace anymore. So, you know, maybe, maybe one or both of these are, but, but they're the, the thing that held the coalition together. But I think this Harley Davids, I, I think, you know, rarely do I see an event where you say, damn, this, this is potentially something that could start moving people that were not, in, not listening and not interested in moving before. It's gonna have a lot of people scratching their heads and wondering. Got a question over here, yeah, David. Oh, Heather's got oh, one I'm sorry, you got, okay, good, yeah. Hi, Heather Podesta with Invariant. Charlie, always love your analysis. You've gone through the facts. You've gone through the enthusiasm. You've talked about the money. Are we going um, to fake news next? No. I'm teasing you. Um, Brian asked the question of wild cards. The one thing you haven't discussed is international interference or the integrity of our election system that people can do everything and then get to the polls and then it's taken out of their hands. I'm not, um, well, first of all, let me say, if someone told me before the last elections, before the last election, that Republicans d were doing what we now know that they did, I wouldn't have believed it, and I would have thought, you know, this is the talk of these people that are just into conspiracy theories and stuff. So, hey, this was, I think given our decentralized method voting, 50 states and counties insul is somewhat insulated. I, I worry about a whole lot of things, but that's further down on my list. But I, I do think, though, that there was an enormous amount of interference in the, the persuasion. I mean, and, and, and folks I know in the, in the intelligence world, they say this is still going on. I mean, that, uh, uh, that you had 
bots or whatever. I'm 64 years old, so I don't understand this stuff. But on both sides, fanning the flames on both sides of the national anthem controversy, just stirring the pot, just stirring the pot, just stoking flames on both sides. And, you know, maybe it's people on one side of a, one group of cubicles are stoking one side, one or the other, but uh, that, that we're having, uh, they are doing everything they possibly can to create mischief and to undermine the credibility of our elections. But I don't really worry quite so much about the mechanics, but I think, I think we've got a little time, but I think that we need to make, we need to make ourselves a harder target uh, than we have been, because we were a soft target. But uh, I, I think that was going to be phase two for them, and they just did phase one in 2016. Yeah, good. We've got, I think we have one more. David, why don't you? So I think you're going to have to take the last question. We're mindful of people's uh, time. Thanks so much. A little closer to home, Economic Club of Washington style. You wrote a little bit about Neil Simon running for Senate as an independent in Maryland. He's outraised Cardin, I think. How, how would you handicap whether it's people concerned about partisan – okay, sure. Oh. So you don't see a movement towards independence as people move away from the parties or dissatisfaction of the parties? Well, I don't see anything happening in Maryland <laughs> of any interest. And I live there. But, you know, sometimes we have vanity candidates and we have uh, – anyway, but uh, I don't see anything. But – because of the electoral co I mean, people say, why can't, if Democrats are skewing more liberal and Republicans are skewing more conservative, why can't we have an independent win? And, 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 and uh, you know, our parties are largely defined by the presidency, presidential elections. And as long as you've got the electoral college, I mean, let's say you had the most fabulous independent candidate for president imaginable. Um, runs a great campaign, plenty of money, wonderful person, presumably they'd win. There's a Democrat here, there's a Republican here. Presumably the independent would get a plurality of the popular vote, which would translate into a plurality of the electoral college vote. Nobody gets a majority. The election gets thrown to the House. Each state gets one vote. Wyoming, one vote. California, one vote. Republicans always have majorities in 27 or 30, whatever states. Game, set, match. It's just over. So that as long as there is a Democrat picking up the four, five, ten states that are going to go Democrat no matter what, there's a Republican that's going to pick up the X number, they're going to go Republican no matter what, it's, it's basically structurally impossible in the current political environment for us to elect an independent president. But that doesn't mean that you couldn't see it happen on the House, Senate, gubernatorial level. But the thing is, you've got, you would have to have somebody who is a brand name at the very beginning and somebody who is known and highly respected and would, would, they would need to pretty much start off on a pedestal. And, and, um, um, and I don't see, uh, I don't, I, you know, I don't think it's going to happen here. I mean, but there, the truth is, there is absolutely nothing wrong with the U.S. Senate that three or four or five truly independent U.S. senators wouldn't cure. And when I say independent, I'm not talking like Bernie independent. I'm talking about real independent. Or a dozen, two dozen true independents in the House. Oh, that, that, that'd do a world of good for the House of Representatives. Um, so, or governors uh, just playing on both sides off each other. That'd be awesome, but um, I'm skeptical about whether it's actually going to happen on a widespread basis. Clearly, we could go on, but we are relentless about being on time at the Economic Club. We're mindful of your time and Charlie's, but I want to thank Charlie very much for all of you.